Right. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for our lunch and learn on the three types of community economic developments, uh, where your, um, uh, where you fit and where your work fits. Um, at this point, I think we're all pretty uh, well established on the etiquette of Zoom and being online, but just as a friendly reminder, please um, mute your microphones when you're not talking. And um, as always, uh, Steve is willing to take questions during and then as well as after. So if you have a question during the presentation, um, please feel free to interrupt or drop a question in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, also, a quick uh, thank you to the um, the U.S. Economic Development Administration um, in support of the EDA University Center uh, for today's Lunch and Learn, which was um, uh, sponsored in part or made possible in part by funding through the EDA um, Center. So, and uh, with that, um, I will actually now turn it over to Steve um, to take over. And so Steve, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um... Brandon and I have been talking about this for a little while now in terms of it might be nice to kind of have a, um, not a refresher, but just kind of revisit the different roles that uh, community economic development practitioner, practitioners can assume. And um, so today's discussion is going to kind of revolve around three general roles um, that practitioners can assume. Um, and then the second part or the second third, the final third is gonna be kind of how does extension educators, you know, there's, a, there's another element that kind of makes extension educators um, a little bit different. And, I, I, and it, it revolves around the notion of scholarship. And I wanna spend some time on that. Uh, so to kind of get a, a, a working philosophy here to kind of build our conversation, uh, what I like to think in terms of our kind of mission, if you will, is that we're helping communities make more informed decisions. That's really what we're trying to do from a, from a kind of an extension perspective and, and also a practitioner's perspective. Um, helping communities make those decisions, that's really kind of very process oriented in terms of, you know, pulling the right people together, engaging in a, a, a constructive dialogue, in, engaging in kind of strategic thinking, and, you know, making sure the uh, voices are being heard, um, and the community is kind of uh, tackling the problem from a, a bottom grassroots type of approach. So it's very process oriented. The more informed element here is really more of the content. Uh, we're trying to help people gather and process the best information possible uh, so that they can make that informed decision. And that's really kind of the content. And that's where this notion of scholarship starts to come into that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so the content is information, it's research based, it's best practices. Best practices uh, are case studies, for example. For example, the work that the, the, the housing group is um, uh, working on is, you know, the, putting the information together, developing a research foundation, but also coming up with a series of case studies that we can kind of help communities better understand some of the different options that are available to them. And those case studies and those best practices is kind of part of that content and gathering that information, okay? So the challenge that we have is really what's the proper balance between the process and the content, okay? Um, this is something that um, when I first started working in Wisconsin, uh, talking with, with uh, Ron Schaefer, this is something that we would have continuous conversations about is that process versus content. Now, the answer to that question really hinges on the preparedness or the capacity of the individual communities that you're working in. I, if you think about the spectrum of community capacity or community preparedness, if you will, I tend to think linearly, cause and effect, okay? But community economic development, community development, economic development is really not a linear process. Um, it's, it's kind of a circular cumulative 
causation type process, okay? So there's been different graphics out there that have tried to show that, but I think that this kind of gets the point here. If we kind of look at communities that are kind of on the spectrum of the, of the left-hand side of this, right? The community has limited capacity. That there's a limited sense of community. The old joke is the only thing that ties the community together is they have a common zip code. Okay, there's very little civic engagement. Uh, there's a passive local government. Um, it's almost, it, it's almost, we were having a discussion, Gary Green and I were having a discussion, um, a, a county educator that was struggling with um, uh, uh, some lakefront communities that were dealing with water quality issues. And those lakefront owners, really they lived there year round so they weren't seasonal they lived there year round but they commuted out they commuted into the appleton um oshkosh area for work and there really wasn't a sense of uh, a sense of community around the lake a sense of engagement around so we kind of got in this discussion of you know well is it ethical to create a false crisis to get people kind of rallying around and addressing an issue you know the idea that people are reactive as opposed to proactive we kind of said eh, that may not be the most ethical thing to do um, at the extreme you can actually have communities that are dysfunctional at multiple levels um, you know the classic example of a colleague at the university of missouri is that the most successful community meeting that he ever had in a 40-year career is the community had a town meeting and they did not have to call the sheriff's department to keep the you know to keep the, the town meeting from you know breaking down into a fight um, so that's at one end at the other end of the spectrum are communities that have high capacity or are you know high levels of preparedness if you will there's a strong sense of community uh, there's high levels of civic engagement there's a proactive local government you could talk about all sorts of characteristics there high levels of social capital resiliency all that simply it's a highly functioning at multiple levels, okay? Now this is kind of a, a, a corkscrew type pattern is because these characteristics can vary over time and also by the issue that you're working on. Uh, for some issues, the community could be have high levels of capacity, but for other issues, um, they, they don't have that capacity in place. The other is that you know, working within a county, for example, is that you have have one community that's up in the corner uh, that is, you know, has very limited capacity, but yet another community in the other side of the county that has very high capacity. And the role that you play is very different in those two communities. Okay, so the challenge, again, is what is the level of preparedness or the capacity of the individual communities, okay? Effective leadership, active pools of volunteers, organized business organizations. Um, the example I like to use is the Chamber of Commerce that actually, you know, provides services to its members as opposed to just simply hosting the community's Fourth of July parade. Uh, there's a network of effective nonprofits. There's strong bridging social capital. Bridging social capital will be connections outside of the community. Okay. Um, higher levels of these lean towards more, more content orientation. Okay. The more kind of prepared the community is, the higher levels of capacity. Probably the role that we're going to play is going to have more content. Uh, in it. Lower levels of capacity preparedness is probably going to lean more towards the process side of things. Okay. Now, one of the questions is this notion, I tend to use the term community economic development as opposed to community development and economic development separately. I think in the context of here, we can actually use, you know, the distinction here is because communities that are kind of at the lower level of capacity, we're really kind of focused more on community development. We're focused on leadership, civic engagement, levels of volunteerism, organizational capacity. Communities that are more um, organized higher levels of preparedness, higher levels of capacity, they're in a better position to tackle economic development type issues. Okay, so are all communities ready to undertake economic development? Not necessarily. 
the answer speaks to levels of preparedness. Sometimes you end up working, you know, what sometimes draws a community to the table to address an issue oftentimes is an economic issue. Uh, a major employer shuts down. Um, there's a major new proposal that comes in mining, frac sand mining, something like that, or large CAFO. There's some kind of economic shock to the system and that draws people together. While it's the economic issue that is drawing their attention, sometimes the practitioner has to kind of walk them backwards because they're not really ready to tackle that. If the community can see that and say, we're not prepared to tackle this issue, we got to go back and, and build some capacity, some preparedness, that community is actually revealing a level of preparedness and capacity uh, that is actually quite positive. Okay. Now, there are three basic roles here that, that Brandon and I have been talking about. And these go back to, um, I got it from a book uh, that was put together by uh, Christensen and Robinson back in 1989. And they kind of identified three basic roles. And these are the three that I want to kind of talk about. It's the self-help approach, the technical assistance, and the conflict approach. Now, the thing is, though, is that these three are not cast in stone. Okay, there are other scholars of community economic development that have suggested numerous roles. Toomey suggested there's eight roles. Kenny talks in terms of two broad roles. Uh, some folks actually said extension educators can, can assume an infinite variety of roles. Okay, and I think that what they're saying is that if you go back to that kind of corkscrew is that, you know, there's an infinite number of places on that corkscrew in essence, and where you're at on that related to the particular issue, you're assuming a different role. Um, I think that's true, but it kind of, um, you know, so this is a spectrum here that we're really talking about. And I think that's what uh, Harland and Smutko were kind of getting at is that we're talking about a spectrum and that role is going to change over time and over issues. But sometimes that's hard to get your head around. So I think that this kind of thinking in terms of self-help, technical assistance, and conflict is a nice way to kind of categorize uh, the, the, the big different themes, okay? So the self-help approach is really based on the premise that um, the people of the community can, should, and will solve their own problems. This is very much a grassroots type of an approach. Okay, the practitioner is a facilitator of the process. This is where that, that process really comes into play here. Okay, the self-help approach requires the practitioner to act differently depending on whether or not the community is well-defined. Okay, the way that this is structured is that even in a high capacity um, uh, community that is, has high levels of capacity, high levels of preparedness, there can still be a role for facilitation, okay? Uh, that's where that kind of multiple hats come into play. There's a spectrum here, okay? If the community is not well-defined or lacks organizational, the practitioner serves as a facilitator, organizer, and even a proxy leader. I think this is a legitimate role for extension educators to kind of actually assume that leadership role. And this is, this is a challenge that I think that we... Uh, as extension have is that we feel pretty comfortable taking on that kind of quasi leadership role. And then when the community starts to build some capacity and starts to build some momentum, we tend to step into the background. And the reason that we tend to step into the background is that the community needs to take ownership and the community needs to kind of assume leadership here. And by us stepping into the background allows the community to kind of build on that momentum and build some sustainability behind the process. Um, the problem, though, from a political perspective is that um, extension really has a difficult time taking credit for the work that's being done. OK, so that's a that's a it's kind of an internal conversation that I think that we should be having continuously. How do we how do we kind of take that leadership role, get the community moving in the right direction, step back, but yet still not get lost in the in the whole process? Okay. On the other hand, the practitioner injects the right kind of information to key participants if the is well 
organized that may not be forward thinking. What this is, is that through the facilitation process, right, is that key pieces of information can be injected. That's the content part. Okay, I think it's legitimate for a, for a, for a facilitator to actually, you know, kind of throw comments into the conversation to kind of get people thinking. Okay, um, how that's done needs to be done in a very subtle way, but I think that it's legitimate particularly if there's a lot of misinformation going on in the conversation or questions are being raised that we actually kind of have research that can give insights into the answers that are being raised, okay? Now that's, a, that's oftentimes a role for a specialist to come in or, uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the joke is, is that the educator, you know, essentially needs to kick the rock over and say, oh my God, look at the mess underneath that. You got to deal with it. The educator may not be able to do that, but as a specialist, I can come in and I can do that uh, because I get the car and leave um, or I disconnect my Zoom connection. Um, so different roles for different levels here, okay? Now, the advantages of the self-help approach. It often builds a stronger sense of community. Okay, because this is kind of grassroots, this is kind of the community addressing the issues on their own. It really is building the capacity of the community, kind of community development at its core. It often evolves into a holistic approach. Uh, there's some crisis. There's a CAFO that wants to come to town, or there's uh, we want to we want to dig up that beautiful landscape for the sand that's underneath it. Okay, or major employers announced that they're shutting down. Um, you know, it's these economic shocks that bring the community together, but through kind of a facilitated conversation, the community can start to address bigger issues or more fundamental issues, a holistic approach. It builds on self-sustaining ability to deal with new problems. We're building the capacity of the community to address its problems. Okay, it allows for community specific solutions. Okay, it's not that we're looking for a magic bullet that we can bring in from the outside here. This is where the case studies come in oftentimes, how to have different communities tackled it, how have different communities gone about it, what can we learn from them, how can we adjust those to fit the needs of our particular community. Okay, there are disadvantages to this approach. It works best in smaller communities or neighborhoods, okay? This is not something that would work best if you're working with the city of Milwaukee, okay? It works best when you're working with neighborhoods. It works best when you're working with communities that um, you can actually have broader community engagement, okay? It, it doesn't work. You, you can't do this on a Madison-wide uh, type of initiative. Okay. It is, it's too cumbersome. Uh, special interests may cloud issues and cause true community to take longer uh, to appear. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a real art of facilitation is how do you keep, uh, what's the right phrase I want here? How do you keep the people with an ax to grind from dominating the conversation? And there's some real keys here uh, skill sets uh, that are required to kind of keep that from happening, okay? Uh, since the practitioner is concerned about the community learning to do it itself, accomplishing specific tasks may become secondary, okay? There's an issue that the community is dealing with, but we're, we get so wrapped up in the process that sometimes we lose sight that there's an actual issue that we're trying to address. OK, that content, you know, it, it's overbalanced on the process side and we lose sight of the content that is needed to actually address the issue that they're dealing with. OK, again, decisions may be based on impression rather than fact. This is that interjecting relevant information into the conversation, bringing the content into the uh, conversation. OK, it's not simply facilitating and the facilitator has no role of injecting information. OK, that's going to the other extreme. OK, the second approach 
is generally, it's called the technical assistance approach. And it's based on the premise that community is well-defined, community has identified a problem or a goal, and it's moving toward the plan of action. Okay, the, essentially what's happened is that uh, the practitioner supports task-oriented actions. Um, the community has decided that we need, we need broadband investment. We have to invest in broadband. Okay, there's lots of grant opportunities out there. Uh, how do we go after those grants? Okay, what grant program is the most appropriate for us? Okay, or, um, you know, how do we put together um, uh, a mentoring program for budding uh, entrepreneurs? How do we actually technically put one of these kind of programs together and how do we technically carry it out? Okay. The practitioner, they approach the technical assistance uh, vary with, uh, with whether one is doing policy development or implementation. Again, this is kind of, um, you know, the community decides that it wants to pursue entrepreneurship. It's just decided it wants to do that, okay? It wants to create a more entrepreneurial friendly ecosystem, okay? Uh, how are we gonna do that? Well, first of all, we gotta have a better understanding of what the business dynamics of the local community looks like. So we could be doing a um, an analysis of the data, if you will, to find out, you know, what is the business mix? What is the mix of large and small and, and medium-sized businesses, that's an applied research project. That's bringing, gathering new information and bringing that information to help inform that policy discussion. And then the implementation would be, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on uh, newly formed small businesses, okay? How can we help mentor them? Okay, so that's the technical side of carrying out the actual strategy. In policy development, the practitioner uses the scientific method to identify strengths and weaknesses of the community, very broad based here, you know, the example of, of, of trying to better understand the business dynamics of the local community or the, uh, the retail and personal service market of the local community for downtown redevelopment, okay? There's a rigorous way in which we can go about doing that, okay? How do we do that in a rigorous manner, a scientific manner? Okay, these analysis then can be used to help form policy. Okay, in policy implementation, the approach is based on the premise that the communities identified policies to achieve the goals. So in essence, when it's actually kind of carrying out kind of the technical assistance here, it's the communities identified, we want to do this. We need help actually implementing it. Okay, so there's a technical side to helping them move forward. Okay. What are the advantages to this approach? Change could be rapid, okay? We've identified the issue and we're moving forward on the issue. It works in any size community, okay? I mean, you can be doing this for the city of Milwaukee. You could be doing this for the city of Madison. It works at any size level. It's task driven. Sometimes it's easier to sink your teeth into it, okay? Uh, some, you know, facilitation skills, sometimes that's, that's nebulous. It's hard to kind of, you know, but if you give me something, okay, I want to know what the business structure of the local community looks like. That's something I had to sink my teeth into. Decisions that are based on fact and not impression, okay? The disadvantages of this approach. Uh, it can give the illusion of finality of the process. Okay, we've identified, we want to invest in broadband. Okay, we've got out, we found a, a partner, a uh, service provider, uh, we've got a grant. Okay, we've invested in broadband, we're done, okay? Or we've developed a mentoring program for, for you know, new business formation. Okay, we're done, okay? That is one of the traps, okay? Uh, the process may be lost to the task accomplishment, okay? One of the things that we need to do with these is that we need to keep going back and reevaluating. Okay, what's changed? What's working? What's not working? Um, how are we progressing? Uh, what are we not making progress on? Okay, that kind of process of going back and reflecting can sometimes get lost. Okay, it can also kind of, um, if we keep the if we keep the process, the facilitation process, the, the conversation process, we're always thinking, okay, what's next? What's next? 
Uh, you often lose that holistic view. You get tunnel vision on a particular project. You're tunnel visioned on broadband. You're tunnel visioned on um, you know, working with small businesses. Uh, and you lose sight of other issues that the community you know, needs to be addressing. Uh, it presumes that the practitioner has or can obtain the necessary technical skills. Um, this is something that I think that practitioners need to be continuously going through professional development. And that professional development can occur formally through listening in on things like lunch and learns like this, or it can be actually sitting down and reading something. Whenever we get a new educator, uh, we, I always would advise them to every other week, block out a day, put an X through it, okay? You're not, uh, you know, your email's turned off, your phone's going to voicemail, uh, you've got a comfortable chair, and what you're doing is you're reading, okay? That professional development, you have to take the time to do that or know where to get that technical assistance. Okay. The conflict approach. Um, this kind of goes, well, the conflict approach is based on the premise that the community is fragmented and gridlocked. Okay. And the practitioner works to break that gridlock. Okay, here the practitioner works as an advocate or a mediator. A lot of times in the conflict approach, you're really kind of playing the role of an advocate. Okay, the practitioner works with a segment, perhaps it's a silent majority of the community and assumed, and the community is assumed to be suppressed by the leadership. Again, this is kind of the historical perspective here is that there's a section of the community that doesn't have a voice. And they're actually being kind of suppressed by the leadership uh, of the community or more other vocal groups. Okay, how do we get this kind of uh, silent majority, if you want to use that phrase, how do you get them at the table? Okay, the role of the practitioner is to act for an advocate for the oppressed group. Okay. Could one assume a role of advocacy for small business owners in the community? Is that part of the conflict approach? Could be, okay, could be. The, the idea here is that you're assuming the role of an advocate. As a mediator, the practitioner acts as a facilitator to open up lines of communication be, between and within subgroups and then works towards compromise to affect change. Okay, so not necessarily acting as an advocate, but really kind of saying, how can we get these different groups together uh, to have a conversation? Okay, the father of this approach is Saul Alinsky. Um, he's an American community organizer. Okay, if you go back and you look, and he was at the University of Chicago when he was doing a lot of this, and you go back and you look at Barack Obama's early days of a community organizer, this is where he was coming out of. It was coming out of the University of Chicago where I think he got his law degree, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's generally considered the founder of modern community organizing. And it's been compared in Playboy magazine to the Thomas Paine as the great American leaders of the non-socialist left. Alinsky gets accused of being a communist and a socialist. He's not really, okay? What he's doing is that he's a community organizer. He's basically laying out the fact that um, you got to break down the good old boys network. You got to break down the premise of the Moloch growth machine theory framework. Okay. That there's got to be broader community involvement. And the only way for that to happen is for the community to get organized. Okay. Uh, Alinsky is often credited with laying the foundation of, for the grassroots political organizations that dominated the 1960s. Hillary Clinton's senior honor thesis was on uh, Alinsky. Um, and, but it's not always the non-socialist left. When the Tea Party movement was first being organized, okay, the, the, the primary spokesman, Adam Brandon, uh, for uh, Freedom Works, which is the organization that kind of tried to coordinate the Tea Party movement, actually bought multiple copies of Alansky's Rules for Radical for the local leadership. 
So the Tea Party movement was actually type of community organizing that Alinsky was arguing for. Okay, now notice the Tea Party movement and the approach that they took. It was very kind of in your face, very conflict oriented. Okay, it drew attention to the concerns that that particular group had. Okay, now the advantages of this approach is that the change, rapid change. Okay, you could almost argue that the Black Lives Movement is kind of following this kind of an approach. And we're seeing today with, with law enforcement and the way that we think about policing in the US is kind of going through a bit of a microscope. Okay, and there's a lot of discussion going on right now that we need change. Communication within the community is opened. Uh, the silent majority tends to have a voice now. Uh, future alliances can be forged, okay? This, uh, different groups that normally are not connected to each other <clears throat> can now actually kind of say, hey, we have common issues that we want to work together on, okay? Some of the disadvantages. Um, it's possible the practitioner can be viewed as biased, okay? If you assume that advocacy role, you know, you're going to be labeled biased, okay? Opponents may become enemies, Okay, the nature of the conflict approach is that it's not necessarily, okay, how are we going to come together to address this issue? It's basically blowback. With the Black Lives Matter movement, it's um, kind of, <clears throat> oh, what is it? The, the blue line movement, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of heat that's created with this conflict approach. Change is oftentimes not sustainable. Um, and we don't, don't plan on living in that community very long. If this is a role that you take on in a particular community, you're gonna be branded as biased and you're probably not gonna be able to work in that community very much longer because you've been labeled, okay? That's why a lot of community organizers move around a lot um, is because they kind of maybe burn bridges. Um, they get labeled as single issued uh, or uh, they're not viewed as unbiased. And I think that's, this is for extension. This is really a very difficult role to assume because we take great pride in that we present unbiased information, okay? This is what the research says. Here's the pros and the cons. Community, you make the decision based on what we currently understand, okay? We take great pride in that. The conflict approach kind of pushes it in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's something that, you know, if 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 the practitioner assumes kind of an advocacy role, we've got to do it with great care. Okay, regardless of which particular role that you assume, there are a lot of common themes throughout all of these. The self-interest is assumed until proven otherwise. Okay, recall growth machine theory. This is cut and pasted from my lecture notes. I should have cut that out. Okay, growth machine theory essentially says that the, um, the people that are in the best position to benefit from growth tend to be landowners, property owners. Um, they're the ones that are driving the conversation. Okay, people get involved in the community because they have self interest. Um, why do people act altruistically? because it makes them feel better about themselves, okay? <clears throat> People act altruistically because it's self-interest. Um, this is not just the people in the community, but it's local governments, like external act agency folks. Uh, it's important to look at the community as a collage of interacting interest groups and each seeking its self-interest of its members. Okay, this is where you get advocacy groups and but this is where it's really difficult to make sure that you don't have people that have basically got an ax to grind uh, that are derailing the conversations. Okay, the practitioner should not expect people to behave rationally from their your perspective. Okay. Um, you may as a as a person, you may have a personal opinion about, you know, I think this is what the community should do. Um, from my rational perspective, this is what the community should do, but the community decides to do something else. Okay, that's their choice. It's their community. Okay. 
It may not appear rational from our perspective, the practitioner's perspective, but it could be perfectly rational from their perspective. They, the community members, may be dealing rationally from their perspective, their goals, their values, and their understanding of the situation, but not necessarily yours. Okay. This is, I, I, my daughter lives in New Orleans and we joke about retiring to, to Louisiana. And uh, it's like, I don't think I could ever live in Louisiana because of this kind of stuff. Okay. The, pract uh, the community practitioner should not worry about who's right or who's wrong. There is no right and wrong. There could be misinformation. There could be bad research that's driving the conversation. So in that regard, there could be right or wrong. But in terms of what the community finally decides, there is no really right or wrong, okay? If the practitioner imposes their own normative views, normative views are basically your value judgments. They begin to lose their ob objectivity and are less able to understand why people are doing what they're doing. Okay, this is a weakness of the conflict approach actually is because you're kind of coming in and advocating. You're bringing in your normative values um, and your personal perspective. And um, you know the community could decide to go in a, a completely opposite direction, um, but that's their decision, okay? Um, it's also important to remember that uh, participation is a means and not an end. Uh, most people participate to do something, to get something done, okay? This is the trade-off between process and content. The reason that I'm volunteering my time and working with this community group to address an issue is I want to address the issue, okay? Yes, I understand that there's a process that we need to go through. I understand that. But if the end, all we're doing is process facilitating meetings and we don't get to the end and actually address the issue, then um, you know they could actually do more damage than good. Each approach to community economic development should expect conflict and take steps to manage it. Uh, I can remember a while back we would do the kind of the with an extension we would do uh, kind of um, needs assessment for professional development and conflict resolution was always at the top. Um, I tell my students uh, uh, that if you ever get a chance to take a class in conflict resolution do it, uh, not just professionally within this kind of a setting, but in personal life, having those kind of conflict uh, mitigation skills are really extremely important. The practitioner must learn to negotiate and form coalitions. Negotiation is all about the dynamics and chemistry of community power. What is that community power structure look like? The effective practitioner should understand power and be able to harness it for the betterment of the community, okay? While we don't want the good old boys to be dominating the conversation, we have to re respect the fact that there is a power dynamics within that community, okay? And we have to work within that power dynamics, okay? Um, most community decisions will not always appear to be rational, purposeful, or controlled, that's fine, okay? Uh, simply says that most community decisions are not made by one person and there's seldom a culprit to blame, okay? A lot of times it's a group decision. And, um, you know, what's the, the, the analogy is, is that, uh, you know, you've got an issue that you're dealing with uh, in the community and you've got two potential solutions. One is, and in one hand, you got some really good Babcock ice cream. The other hand, you got some really good compost. And uh, either solution will, will work, uh, but in the form of compromise, you combine the two and you end up with something that's useless. Okay. Uh, these themes tend to apply regardless of the approach. The practitioner who keeps them in mind is more likely to stay sane. Okay. Now, what makes an extension educator an extension? different, okay? When we look at these different roles that we can play, there is something that makes UW, the vision of extension, different. And what that is, is the notion of scholarship, okay? And this is something that um, I wanna spend some time talking about 
Okay. I tried to look at different definitions of what scholarship is. And um, there's a couple of themes here. Okay. I didn't I didn't put on the slide where I got the specific definitions, but it's kind of the, the traditional Webster stuff like that. Um, one is the academic study or achievement of learning on a high scale. Okay, scholarship essentially means that we're raising our game. We're trying to better understand the issues that we're dealing with within the community. Okay. We're fo focusing on the content here. We're focusing on kind of the bringing the best information that we can to the table. Okay. But there's also scholarship in terms of facilitation skills. Okay. So there's a balance here. Next one, learning, uh, knowledge acquired by study, the academic attainment. Don't you love it when they use the word to define the word? Uh, there's several definitions of scholarship that basically is saying it's what scholarly people do. Um, that doesn't help me. Okay. Acquired by study. Okay. This is that, remember I mentioned that uh, my advice to new county educators is that every other week you put an X through a day and you basically read. Okay. Knowledge acquired by study. What is the current issue of the Journal of the Community Development Society? Okay, I got it. Um, and I'm going to take the time and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read it. Okay, continuous professional development by study. Uh, third one, knowledge resulting from study research in a particular field. Same as the second one, just a little different wording. Okay, uh, fourth one is the activity methods or attainment of a scholar. Again, using the word to define itself. The all idea here is that we're trying to increase our understanding. We're trying to increase our awareness of an issue. Okay, that's the notion of scholarship. Okay, my lame attempt is creating new knowledge. Okay, creating new knowledge is essentially what we're trying to do within the community setting. We're trying to bring relevant new information into the conversation. What does the latest research say about a particular issue? What do we know? What don't we know based on that research? Okay, if you're to bring that information to the table, then you have to be somewhat involved in understanding what that is. Okay, now, just for the sake of discussion here, um, I'm gonna bring some stuff in from uh, the UW-Madison uh, Social Sciences Divisional Committee. This is the uh, tenure committee on the Madison campus for the social sciences, which is where community economic development would fit. And the reason I want to go through this is that this committee kind of establishes, I shouldn't say it establishes, um, but it's kind of the, the gatekeeper for notions of scholarship um, with on, within the Madison campus. Um, I know that the Department of Extension is having this discussion around uh, post-tenure review and things like that. And I think that this kind of within the roles that we play, this notion of scholarship kind of help us think a little bit deeper, okay? So these are the four things um, that they kind of identify, okay? Scholarly inquiry that makes a contribution of knowledge, okay? underlined and bolded. That's my kind of lame attempt at the previous slide of create new knowledge. That's my interpretation of that underlined and bolded line. Okay, creating, con contributing to knowledge, contributing to our understanding. Okay, uh, one or more of the following ways, conducting research with appropriate methods and rigor. Okay, that is actually going out and, and conducting a study. Uh, conceptualizing and theorizing in an original way. How do you how do you conceptualize these dif different issues that you're struggling with, that the community is struggling with? Okay, as you sit down and try to conceptualize what they're dealing with, in essence, what you're doing is you're theorizing. Okay, third one. And this is italicized because I think it's this is specific. This is unique to extension and what we do. Synthesizing, critically analyzing, and clarifying extant knowledge and research. 
what's already out there? What is available? What can we learn from what other folks have been doing studying this issue? Okay. Again, that every other week sitting down and I'm going to, my community's working on broadband. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a day and I'm going to sit down and start reading up on what is the current research on broadband. And I talk to uh, Matt, I talked to Tessa, I talked to Deller, and they've suggested these three different things to look at. And I'm going to do that. Okay. That is kind of necessary, a necessary condition for scholarship. For developing innovative methods for conducting scholarly inquiry, um, community engaged scholarship. How do we do community engaged scholarship? Okay. Developing methods methods for doing community engaged scholarship, I think is ripe for what extension brings to the table. Okay, how we do that, I think it could be really, really important. Okay, I actually should have highlighted um, that one too. Um, five, conducting research related to the solution of practical problems of individuals, groups, organizations, or societies. Okay, what we're trying to do is to actually be applied. This fifth point here, this is the Wisconsin idea. Okay, we're doing applied research to bring information to address a problem. That's the embodiment of the Wisconsin idea. It's the embodiment of the engaged university. Okay, so all of these elements are part of what defines scholarship on the Madison campus. Okay. Now, now, how do you document this? Okay, evidence of research performance. Okay, uh, there are actually, there's a couple of others here that I deleted because they're completely irrelevant for us. Okay, number one, scholarly books, monographs, chapters, written materials, but notice media, videotapes. Uh, who does videotapes anymore? Computer programs, technical reports, websites. How do you convey the results of the research that you've been doing? It can take many forms, okay? Number two, articles published or accepted for publication in scholarly or professional journals. The reason that that's underlined is because that's the default, okay? How many of you have heard the phrase publish or perish? What they're talking about is number two, okay? And I think that this is something that the Department of Extension is struggling with, okay? If this is a, if this is a tradition on the Madison campus, how do we fit into that? Okay. Number three, extension outreach publications. Okay. Yeah, that's the Wisconsin idea. How do we do that? Uh, citation of works. Uh, da, 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 da. Five research grants, awards, going after that grant money to help support the work that you're doing. Okay. Um, sex evaluation by, you know, what do you pairs at other universities, other extension services? What do they think of your work? Okay. If you are putting together a new program, for example, and you have a colleague in, say, Missouri, right, and you float this material past them and say, hey, what do you think? You know, are you taking their feedback seriously? Uh, number seven, papers read at professional meetings. Uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff here you can look at at your leisure. But going to professional conferences and presenting your work is a viable part of documenting scholarly work. Okay, going and present. Have you ever heard the phrase, you think you know something until you try to teach it? Putting together and putting things in writing, right? forcing yourself to sit down and write this stuff out kind of forces you to think it through, okay? And then presenting it kind of forces you to think through what it is you're trying to do. By going through that process, you think deeper about the programming that you're working on. So don't think of it as, it's, it's, it's an integral part of the job in the sense of, you know, elevating the quality of the work that you're doing. Uh, number eight, patents and evidence of intellectual property. Um, I, yeah, um, 
I'm not comment on that one. Okay. I tried to put together a little, um, what do you say I'm doing on time here? Oh, geez, running out of time here. A little logic model here, okay, of how we kind of go about our job. Um, first, what's the situation? Uh, what's the issue the community is struggling with? Um, is this a symptom or an underlying issue that they're really dealing with? Okay. Are they kind of scratching at the surface or are they actually getting down to the underlying problem? Okay, that's the situation. The inputs, who are, what are the, what are the local resources? Uh, what are the local partners? What about extension colleagues? Uh, grant money to help pay for some of this. Existing knowledge base, okay? Those are all the inputs that we use to help develop a program and implement that program. The outputs are meetings, workshops, issue-focused research, scholarly products, okay? The ultimate outcome is, and this I get this from Jim Resick, you know you've been successful in a community but you've essentially worked your way out of a job, okay? The community's dynamic, it's well-organized, it's, it's resilient, um, it's, it can tackle its own, it, it doesn't need you anymore, okay? That's the ultimate outcome. The question here on the output is the process versus the content, okay? The process is the meetings and the workshops, but the content really is what goes into those meetings, what goes into those, you know, the research to, 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 to kind of facilitate the meeting around. Do we take the step, the next step and produce scholarly products? Okay, that's where the conflict is occurring, I think within the Department of Extension right now, is that scholarly products. Now on the Madison campus, scholarly products means journal articles or academic books, okay? How many journal articles have you published? Where have you published them, okay? How many citations is that paper getting, okay? How many books have you written? That's what Madison traditionally looks at. That's the traditional way that universities have approached looking at scholarly products, the content, okay? They struggle with documenting outcomes, okay? That's something that the Madison campus does have a hard time struggling with. So we tend to fall back to measuring these outputs, okay? For extension faculty and staff, greater emphasis on outcomes is the work, uh, is the work causing a difference. Okay, we tend to focus on whether or not the community is making progress on the issues that it's struggling with. So we're more comfortable talking about outcomes. Unfortunately, the campus is more focused on outputs. Okay, but that work based on or adding to our scholarly understanding of the issues. Okay, are we advancing our understanding of how housing issues are affecting Wisconsin communities? Okay, are we advancing our understanding in a way? And importantly, are we sharing that with, inf with our colleagues? Okay, this is one of the things that is really frustrating from a, from, a, from a specialist perspective is I know that there's a lot of work out there being done on some particular issue, right? But people don't write it down. They don't publish it. You can't find it. You could be doing award-winning work, but if it's not documented in some type of traditional way, then it's kind of lost. And that's a shame. So philosophy of working with communities, helping communities make more informed decisions. Um, that's the process. The, the helping the decision is the process oriented. The more informed is the content oriented. I think the scholarship oftentimes within the Madison context is really more focused on the content. Less so the process and more so the content, okay? So the challenge is what's the proper balance between process and content, okay? It still hinges on the level of preparedness or capacity of individual communities within the Madison context, there's gonna be a bias towards content because that's what they feel comfortable with, okay? So I'm going to stop there, and I think I stayed within, yeah, 
I actually Wonderful. stayed within the time period here. So if you want, I'll stop sharing. And if there's a question or a comment, um, I can go back and reshare. Great. And can you all hear me? I was, Kristen is ready to jump in. I was having spotty internet. I could hear you, but I, it was saying that it was unstable. So we can, um, we can. first, thank you, Steve, for, for uh, as always, for taking the time and, and uh, sharing and uh, presenting today. Um, we do, we are coming up against the end of the hour and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time, but uh, we do have an opportunity for a question and um, I don't know if Diana is still on or if she jumped off, I think, oh, Diana is still on. So um, Diana, I'll give you an opportunity because you did make a comment early on about um, uh, kind of bias and advocacy. And I don't know if you want to uh, bring that up again or if, if that opportunity has passed, but just as a yeah. opportunity. Sure, Please. yeah, everyone. Um, Steve can read what I wrote, and um, we don't have much time to talk about it. But anyway, I think that's probably a whole other webinar of does it make sense to try, even try to be unbiased anymore? I don't think so. That's the, you're right. That's worth an entirely different discussion, um, and preferably over beers on the terrace on a beautiful day. Um, you know, it's. You know, we have, as an institution, historically striven to be unbiased uh, and not advocate. But um, I don't know if there's a generational change, um, but I think that folks are becoming a little bit more uncomfortable with that and are feeling more comfortable taking on an advocacy role. Um, but I think you're right. That's a that's an excellent comment, and um, I think we need to continue to have conversation around that. I cheat when I when I'm talking to like uh, 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 the media and whatnot. I uh, particularly Wisconsin media. I say, well, if I'm wearing my UW Madison, if I'm wearing my UW Extension hat, you know, blah 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 blah. But if I take that off and put my Madison hat on, this is what I think. Okay, now I'm taking my Madison hat off and I'm putting my extension hat back on. And people understand that and they appreciate that. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a fine line. Wonderful. And again, I, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and I think we'll end here. Uh, Steve, I don't know if you have a couple minutes if someone has. Sure, uh, I'm, I'd, be more than, I'd be more than pleased to stay on the line if somebody wants to take issue with something I said. Dull are you ignorant fool. Wonderful. Well, and thank you all everyone for joining and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day and look for an upcoming webinar again on um, May 26th. So uh, this now concludes the webinar.